and Grindelwald, a tranquil alpine village where the alphorn sound is normal. It fits the peaceful setting of this glacier village in which 3,000 people live simply and quietly. Except in March of 1978, when Grindelwald played host to 40 young men who brought the alien sounds of their game to this friendly place. For the young men who came here, the challenge was imposing, like that of a mountaineer climbing toward a goal. Up! Oh! 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 This is Uniroyal number four, after East York, Aviemore, and Quebec City. The top junior curlers in the world, hailing from 10 countries, will try for the honors that went to Olsten, Gausel, and Jenkins in three previous editions. Canada and Sweden have dominated this event, but each year there's been a threat from Norway, the United States, or Scotland. And each year the caliber of curling has grown better and better. Here to raise the Uniroyal banner, signaling the start of the 78 championship, are three hostesses from Quebec who helped to make it memorable a year ago. Grindelwald intends to match the hospitality of Quebec. It has a superb arena, part of a sports center that would do any place proud. Grindelwald has its own hostesses, four of whom guide the ceremonial stone, as Swiss curling president Jean Shield clearly approves. The teams are hopeful, and all week long the Swiss fans will watch them perform and cheer the efforts of Luke Singer, Tomlinson, Lewin, Shape, Gausel, back again, Alvera, back for a fourth time, Sterna, Tronk, Hawkinson, and Hamilton. Before they start, the friendly curling handshakes and then the traditional exchange of national pins. Scotland has had just one world champion in 20 years of international curling. That was Chuck Hay in 1967. Their 78 entry in the Uniroyal, skipped by Colin Hamilton, was to lose only once in nine games to Canada 8-5, to five, easily making the playoffs. Massima Alvera of Italy thought that this could be his year in his fourth try. He lost every game in 75 and 76, then went four and five last season. But this time it wasn't to be. One win and eight defeats for Italy. Denmark had a repeater, Tommy Sterna, who led the Danes at Aviemore and improved his record this time beating Italy, France, and Norway for three wins and six defeats. His quartet was tough for all opposition. Watching the Scandinavians closely was Sven Eklund, vice president of the International Curling Federation. Yves Tronk of France was just not impressive. He had nothing but bad luck in losing eight out of nine. Here's an example. One up going home against the United States. Tronk misses a takeout, kills his own shot stone, setting up the Americans for a winning two. Scottish writer Willie Kemp notes that one. This is Rainer Shape of Germany, a surprise to many. The Germans won four topping Italy, France, Denmark, and Switzerland, matching their performance at Aviemore. Their coach, Sasha Fischer-Weppler, points out the growth in German curling circles. We had about 100% increase during the last year, and I think it will grow, and I think this performance will really help. 
what our problem is we haven't got enough special curling ice rinks. Most clubs play on hockey ice, and that isn't too good an advertisement for curling. This is the team wearing Swiss colors. Felix Luxinger delighted the host fans on occasion, but lacked the consistency to become a contender. Like the Germans, the Swiss wound up with four wins and five losses. They produced an exceptional effort against Scotland, but Colin Hamilton made his last draw good to beat Switzerland 5-4. Very early in the week, the chances looked likely for another battle to the wire between Canada and Sweden. Paul Gausel had seven straight wins when he met the Swedish team. It was a 3-3 tie on the 10th end. And this was a freeze attempt. A little bit heavy, leaving Sweden's Tom Hawkinson with a chance to hand the Canadians their first defeat. It's a straight outturn takeout. Gausel is not unbeatable, and a word from Coach Warren Hansen. I'm not going to influence him much in a technical aspect. He's got his own style, his own way of approaching things. He's been successful. But I think where I may come into the picture and be of assistance to them is in the area of scouting teams. Uh, I know I have this week assisted them a couple of times in suggesting diet as to what they should eat, when they should eat it, and I think I can be of assistance. The United States finished the round robin at five and four in a tie for fourth place. Jeff Tomlinson of Seattle went into a tiebreaker with Shore Lewin of Norway, a skip in the silver broom of 1974, and still a junior. The Americans were one up going home, but Tomlinson needed a tough double takeout. He nicked only one. And that gave Norway a free draw for the two points that would send Shore Loon and his team into the semifinals. You'll notice nobody held the broom in case they needed three sweepers. But Loon has the weight. Norway wins it six to five. And that sets it up for the semifinals. Norway versus Canada and Scotland against Sweden. But first, a break to leave Grindelwald Station by rail. Up out of the sheltered valley with formidable Mount Iger beside us and a huge snowy blanket down below. This is the way to the alpine peaks of the Schiltern and the Jungfrau, and below them, the rail junction of Kleine Scheidig at 7,000 feet. Here, the ski crowd can do its thing, with beauty of all types all around. active in the Swiss mountains. Some sit and relax, and some sit and burn. And people enjoy their life at any age. <laughs> now the semifinals. Scotland with eight wins and one loss, going against Sweden with six and three. Norway, with a record of five and four, will challenge Canada at eight and one, as Paul Gausel tries for three straight Canadian victories. Beforehand, Scotland's Colin Hamilton had the philosophical approach. We played well in the first game against them. I beat them 
We'll play the same this time, we'll beat them again, but if not, it'll be difficult. Um, Do you plan on using any particular strategy against the Swedish team? Not really, just play a normal game. And your normal game would be to hit and hit uh, all the time? Yeah, we're up, we hit. We're down, we need to start drawing. You know? Just hope we need to keep hitting. Sweden jumped off to a 2-0 lead, but Scotland tied it with two on the third end. Hawkinson made it 3-2 Sweden, then the fifth end was blank, and with his last stone here on six, Hamilton was forced to draw. Come on! He has to beat out that red stone at the back to get his point, and Hamilton does it. It's 3-3. But Hawkinson still is confident at this point in the game. I don't know exactly the strategy. I know how to play, so I play my own game. Do you think the ice lends itself to a come-around game, Tom? The ice here in Grindelwald? Well, I think so, because it's keen. You can sweep it hard, and can go around, hit them. The Swedish skip did some successful hitting on the seventh and eighth ends, and he blanked both of them. But on the ninth, he must hit and stick facing two Scottish counters. And that's what he does. Sweden leads four to three going home. The Scottish rooting section watched as Hamilton could only tie with last rock on the 10th. On the extra end, with Sweden lying one, the Scots have to go for a freeze with Collins' final stone. It's not quite what they wanted, but Hamilton has given it a super try, pleasing his coach, Chuck Hay. It's a big trip to come over here, and never having been across the border, and never been in any other part of the world, they're, they're adapting very well. That they are, Chuck, but here is the shot that will end Scotland's hope. Oh, oh, oh. Hawkinson kills two stones, but his shooter sticks for the all-important winner. And Sweden has advanced to the World Junior Final for a fourth straight year. Denied a chance to play in the Silver Broom in 76 because he was too young, Hawkinson is one win away from a World Junior crown. But who will be his opponent in the final? Canada's Gausel is in deep trouble after four ends. Down 3-1 to Norway. Here, he's trying for two on the fifth end. But Paul rolls too far. He gets only one. And for him, it's still catch-up curling. End six and seven were blank. Then Gausel stole one on the eighth to tie it 3-3. The tide was turning on ice Paul called inconsistent. It depends what sheet you're on. Some sheets are more swingy than others. Others are very straight. And so far, you've had a lot of success with it, though. Well, I can't complain, I guess. We wanted to win nine straight. I mean, everybody wants to, but, you know, eight and one isn't bad. Better to lose then than no. It's win or lose right now. And Gauza wants to stick to lie two on the ninth end. He makes it, putting the pressure on the Norwegian skip. Lewin, who missed his last rock on the eighth, will fall behind if this shot is off the mark. And he rolls out. Canada steals and leads for the first time in the game, four to three. On the 10th end, the Canadian team had no intention of losing its advantage. Lewin had no chance to set up more than a single. And this was his final stone. Again, he's somewhat heavy. His stone rolls away and Gauzel wins it four to three. History has repeated itself. Four World Junior Finals and four straight matchups between Canada and Sweden have developed for the top honor in junior curling. Symbolic of that honor is the Uniroyal Trophy and the medals and trays of special distinction. Prior to the final, Canada and Sweden received good wishes from those on the sidelines, and Paul Gausel has a pregame outlook. Well, we'll sort of have to play it by ear, you know. It, it all depends on whether we win the toss or lose the toss or whether we get the first rock over the hog line and they're doing the shooting 
you know, it's very important that, that we get the first rock in the rings or over the hog line so that they're throwing at it and they haven't got time to figure out the draw weight. Here's that coin toss. Per Lindemann of Sweden throws and Canada's John Ferguson calls. Sweden wins it, prompting Tom Hawkinson to suggest. Well, if I can take two in the first hand, it's always nicer to, uh, then you can clean everything and play a typical takeoff game. Because uh, Paul goes with his team is a very good draw team. The world final is on. Sweden scores one on the first end, and Canada ties it on the second. With this last stone on the third end, Hawkinson tries to blank. But his stone hangs around for a single and a two to one lead. The fourth was blank. Then Canada set up two counters on the fifth. And just like that, with a superb double kill, Hawkinson bails out of trouble, forcing Gausel to play another blank. In the sixth end, there was another excellent shot by Sweden. Second, Lars Lindgren pulls off a tough raise takeout. Gausel can't get anything going, and with last stone, he has to try to blank again in order to keep the hammer. But Stern and Ferguson collide, and they can't roll out the Canadian stone. It's one for Canada, a point they didn't want, and a two-all tie after six ends. Sweden's Hawkinson still has control, and Tommy looks very confident. Now on the seventh end, you're about to see four of the finest shots of any curling game, any time. Number one, a great hit and roll for partial cover behind the guard. Hawkinson has to skin past the guard. Mission accomplished. Out goes the Canadian stone. Gausel will try to put it back with an in-turn draw. Fully buried behind the guard. Hawkinson knows he has to dig down deep for this one. He wants a come around takeout, and he'd like to blank the end as well. Just a brilliant shot by Tommy Hawkinson. And the score remains tied 2-2 after seven. The struggle continues on the eighth end. Gausel has a chance to steal. He wants to draw behind that corner guard. And you can't do it much better than that. Gausel has really put it behind cover, and Hawkinson has no choice. He can't remove it. The only shot is a freeze on top of the Canadian stone. The ice has been keen all week, and now it is lightning quick.
but the Swedish stone doesn't pull enough. It sits beside the Canadian stone. Gausel can punch it out to lie two. Paul's intern has to do some cutting. But he gets enough, and Canada has a little biter to go with Gausel's shooter, a biter that is destined to change the game's momentum. With his last stone, Hawkinson now must stick around. He could be a trifle heavy. And there it is, a roll-up. And Canada moves in front, rate of two after eight ends. Don Duguid feels that could be a turning point, and partner Don Chevrier is inclined to agree. Sweden blanks the ninth end, so it's three two Canada going home. But Ferguson fails to remove a corner guard, and Lindemann watches his draw go behind it. He's got a beauty, and Gausel ponders his chances of getting it out. Paul will have to play a gentle outturn come around, trying to ease it out of the rings. This will be touch and go. No, it's not enough. It's still a counter, and Gausel knows it can be costly. Sweden has the chance to set up the two points needed to win. And right here, Thomas Hawkinson makes a decision that long will be debated in curling circles. He could split the house with a draw to the open side, but instead he decides to go in again around the front guard. The world junior crown is tantalizingly close. He's by the guard, but it's going deep. Back to sit beside the other Swedish stone. The double takeout is there, but it's over strange outside ice, and Gausel mulls it over. Can I get it going the other way with that turn, you think? Like if it floated and hit that other one first. Would it go, do you think? I'd have to throw a lot of weight. It's got to be this way, eh? Okay, put the broom. Put the broom down. There more. Give me the edge of that rock. The decision is made. And like everybody, Paul's father, Bob Gausel, wonders if it's the right one. The crucial shot of the week. An intern attempt at the double takeout. Perfect. The twin kill to snuff out potential victory for Sweden. Gausel gets a very deserving ovation, and Hawkinson wonders now if he should have gone the other way. The pressure's off for Gausel, but Hawkinson can force the extra end. He goes for the same outturn draw with almost 12 feet of house to hit. It might be light, and the skip starts to sweep. No, he's short. The Canadians are jubilant. They're world junior curling champions. A 4-2 victory, and Canada has captured the Unero title for the third time in four years. For Gausel and Kelly Stern, it's their second gold medal, but a first for Doug McFarlane and John Ferguson. They're tops in the junior curling world. Oh, oh.
the wind-up of a most spectacular week, packed with drama and emotion, and the kind of splendid shot-making that now is expected in the Uniroar. Joe Shield of Switzerland, ICF President Coley Campbell, and Uniroar President Todd Allard will officiate. Here are the curlers who have made it such a great sports feature in Grindelwald. Three teams are on the podium, Canada, Sweden, and Scotland, for the medal presentations. And the very proud moment when Claude Allard presents the Uniroyal Trophy to the best junior team in the world. Coley Campbell will honor the runner-up team. It's silver medals for Sweden to Hawkinson, Per Lindemann, Lars Lindgren, and Eric Fiorimo. Grindelwald chairman Hans Stettler then presents the bronze medals to the third place team from Scotland. Two of the Scots, David Ramsey and Doug Edwardson, also received all-star awards with Gausel and McFarland of Canada. And Scotland's Colin Hamilton was voted most sportsmanlike player by the curlers themselves. The Uniroyal banner is lowered as the Swiss curling president looks on and the organizing chairman marches out to pass it forward to the men who will guide the Uniroyal in Moose Jaw in 1979, Roy Thiessen and Bob Hicks. Ken Claver, Uniroyal vice president, smiles his approval. And the junior champions hear this tribute from the president. I couldn't believe that that shot could be made that Paul Gausel pulled it off and it has to come down as one of the greatest events I have seen. And there's an invitation for next year. It gives us great pleasure to invite all of you, players and spectators, to come to Moose Jaw in 1979. Thank you. And so it will be, Uniroyal number five, to be held in the Canadian West next year, where curling is a way of life. But those who came to tiny Grindelwald will never forget the beauty, the charm, or the sounds of Switzerland. <laughs>